Wine on the Desert by Max Brand. There was no hurry, except for the thirst like clotted salt in the back of his throat. And Durant rode on slowly, rather enjoying the last moments of dryness before he reached the cold water in Tony's house. There was really no hurry at all. He had almost 24 hours head start, for they would not find his dead man till this morning. After that, there'd be several hours delay before the sheriff gathered a sufficient posse and started on his trail. Or perhaps the sheriff would be fool enough to come alone. Durant had been able to see the wheel and fan of Tony's windmill for more than an hour, but he could not make out the ten acres of the vineyard until he had topped the last rise, for the vines had been planted in a hollow. The lowness of the ground, Tony used to say, accounted for the water that gathered in the well during the wet season. The rain sank through the desert sand, through the gravels beneath, and gathered in a bowl of clay hardpan far below. In the middle of the rainless season, the well ran dry, but long before that, Tony had every drop of the water pumped up into scores of tanks to the vines, and from time to time, let them sip enough life to keep them until the winter darkened overhead suddenly, one November day, and the rain came down, and all the earth made a great hushing sound as it drank. Durant had heard that whisper of drinking when he was here before but he never had seen the place in the middle of the long drought. The windmill looked like a sacred emblem to Durant, and the twenty stodgy tar-painted tanks blessed his eyes, but a heavy sweat broke out at once from his body, for the air of the hollow, unstirred by wind, was hot and still as a bowl of soup. A reddish soup. The vines were powdered with thin red dust also, they were wretched, dying things to look at, for the grapes had been gathered, the new wine had been made, and now the leaves hung in ragged tatters. Durant rode up to the squat adobe house and right through the entrance into the patio. A flowering vine clothed three sides of the little court. Durant did not know the name of the plant, but it had large white blossoms with golden hearts that poured sweetness on the air. Durant hated the sweetness. It made him more thirsty. He threw the reins off his mule and strode into the house. The water cooler stood in the hall outside the kitchen. There were two jars made of a porous stone, very ancient things, and the liquid which distilled through the pores kept the contents cool. The jar on the left held the water. That on the right contained wine. There was a big tin dipper hanging on a peg beside each jar. Durant tossed off the cover of the vase on the left and plunged it in until the delicious coolness closed well above his wrist. Hey, Tony, he called. Out of his dusty throat, the cry was a mere groaning. He drank and called again clearly. Tony, a voice pealed from the distance. Durant pouring down the second dipper of water, smelled the alkali dust which had shaken off his own clothes. It seemed to him that heat was radiating like light from his clothes, from his body, and the cool dimness of the house was soaking it up. He heard the wooden leg of Tony bumping on the ground, and Durant grinned. Then Tony came in with that hitch and side swing with which he accommodated the stiffness of his artificial leg. His brown face shone with sweat as though a special ray of light were focused on it. Ah, Dick, he said, good old Dick. How long since you come last? Wouldn't Julia be glad? Wouldn't she be glad? Oh, ain't she here, asked Durant, jerking his head suddenly away from the dripping dipper? Oh, she's away at Nogales, said Tony. Get so hot, I said. You go up to Nogales, Julia, where the wind don't forget to blow. She cried, but I made her go. Oh, did she cry, asked Durant? Huh, Julia, that's a good girl, said Tony. Yeah, you bet she's good, said Durant. He put the dipper quickly to his lips, but did not swallow for a moment. He was grinning too widely. Afterward, he said, 
You wouldn't throw some water into that mule of mine, would you, Tony? Tony went out with his wooden leg clumping loud on the wooden floor, softly in the patio dust. Durant found the hammock in the corner of the patio. He lay down in it and watched the color of sunset flush the mists of desert dust that rose to the zenith. The water was soaking through his body. Hunger began, and then the rattling of pans in the kitchen and the cheerful cry of Tony's voice. What do you want, Dick? I got some pork. You don't want pork? I'll make you some good Mexican beans, hot. Aha. Uh -huh. Eh, hey, I know that old Dick. I have plenty of good wine for you, Dick. Tortillas. Even Julia can't make tortillas like me. And what about a nice young rabbit? All blowed full of buckshot, growled Durant. No, no. I killed him with the rifle. You kill rabbits with a rifle, repeated Durant with a quick interest. It's the only gun I have, said Tony. If I catch them in the sights, they are dead. A wooden leg cannot walk very far. I must kill them quick, you see. They come close to the house about sunrise and flop their ears. I shoot through the head. Yeah, yeah, muttered Durant, through the head. He relaxed, scowling. He passed his hand over his face, over his head. Then Tony began to bring the food out into the patio and lay it on a small wooden table. A lantern hanging against the wall of the house included the table in a dim half-circle of light. They sat there and ate. Tony had scrubbed himself for the meal. His hair was soaked in water and sleeked back over his round skull. A man in the desert might be willing to pay five dollars for as much water as went to the soaking of that hair. Everything was good. Tony knew how to cook, and he knew how to keep the glasses filled with his wine. This is old wine. This is my father's wine. Eleven years old, said Tony. You look at the light through it. You see that brown in the red? That's the soft that time puts in good wine, my father always said. What killed your father, asked Durant. Tony lifted his hand as though he were listening or as though he were pointing out a thought. The desert killed him. I found his mule. It was dead, too. There was a leak in the canteen. My father was only five miles away when the buzzard showed him to me. Five miles? Just an hour? Good Lord, said Durant. He stared with big eyes. Just dropped down and died, he asked. No, said Tony. When you die of thirst, you always die just one way. First, you tear off your shirt, then your undershirt. That's to be cooler. And the sun comes and cooks your bare skin, and then you think there is water everywhere if you dig down far enough. And you begin to dig. The dust comes up your nose. You start screaming. You break your nails in the sand. You wear the flesh off the tips of your fingers to the bone. He took a quick swallow of wine. Now, without your seeing a man die of thirst, how do you know they start screaming? asked Durant. They got a screaming look when you find them, said Tony. Here, take some more wine. The desert can never get to you here. My father showed me the way to keep the desert away from the hollow. Yeah, yeah we live pretty good here, no? Yeah, said Durant, loosening his shirt collar. Yeah, pretty good. Afterward, he slept well in the hammock until the report of a rifle waked him and he saw the color of dawn in the sky. It was such a great round bowl that for a moment he felt as though he were above looking down into it. He got up and saw Tony coming in holding a rabbit by the ears, the rifle in his other hand. You see, said Tony, breakfast came and called on us. And then he laughed. <laughs> Durant examined the rabbit with care. It was nice and fat, and it had been shot through the head, through the middle of the head. Such a shudder went down the back of Durant that he washed gingerly before breakfast. He felt that his blood was cooled for the entire day. It was a good breakfast, too, with flapjacks and stewed rabbit with green peppers and a quart of strong coffee. Before they had finished, the sun struck through the east window and started them sweating. Give me a good look at that rifle of yours, Tony, will you? Durant asked. You take a good look at my rifle, but don't you steal the luck that's in it, laughed Tony. He brought the 15-shot Winchester. 
loaded right to the brim, asked Durant. I always load it full the minute I get back home, said Tony. Tony, come outside with me, commanded Durant. They went out from the house. The sun turned the sweat of Durant to hot water and then dried his skin so that his clothes felt transparent. Tony, I gotta be damn mean, said Durant. Stand right there where I can see you. Uh, don't try to get close. Now listen. The sheriff's gonna be along this trail sometime today looking for me. He'll load up himself and all his gang with water out of your tanks. Then he'll follow my sign across the desert. Get me? He'll follow if he finds water on the place. But he's not gonna find water. Not gonna find water. Now what you done, poor Dick, said Tony. Now look, I could hide you in the old wine cellar where nobody... The sheriff's not gonna find any water, said Durant. It's gonna be like this. He put the rifle to his shoulder, aimed, fired. The shot struck the base of the nearest tank, ranging down through the bottom. A semicircle of darkness began to stain the soil near the edge of the iron wall. Tony fell on his knees. No, 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 Dick. Good Dick, he said. No, 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 look. All the vineyard, it will die. It will turn into old deadwood. Shut your face, said Durant. Now I've started. I kind of like the job. Tony fell on his face, put his hands over his ears. Durant drilled a bullet hole through the tanks one after another. Afterward, he leaned on the rifle. Take my canteen and go in and fill it with water out of the cooling jar, he said. Snap into it, Tony. Tony got up. He raised the canteen and looked around him, not at the tanks from which the water was pouring so that the noise of the earth drinking was audible, but at the rows of his vineyard. Then he went into his house. Durant mounted his mule. He shifted the rifle to his left hand and drew out the heavy coat from its holster. Tony came dragging back to him, his head down. Durant watched Tony with a careful revolver, but he gave up the canteen without lifting his eyes. The trouble with you, Tony, said Durant, is you're yellow. I'd have fought a tribe of wildcats with my bare hands before I'd let them do what I'm doing to you. Will you sit back and take? Tony did not seem to hear. He stretched out his hands to the vines. Oh, my God, said Tony. Will you let them all die? Durant shrugged his shoulders. He shook the canteen to make sure that it was full. It was so brimming that there was hardly room for the liquid to make a sloshing sound. Then he turned the mule and kicked it into a dog trot. Half a mile from the house of Tony, he threw the empty rifle to the ground. There was no sense packing that useless weight, and Tony with his peg leg would hardly come this far. Durant looked back a mile or so later and saw the little image of Tony picking up the rifle from the dust, then staring earnestly after his guest. Durant remembered the neat little hole clipped through the head of the rabbit. Wherever he went, his trail never could return to the vineyard in the desert. But then, commencing to picture to himself the arrival of the sweating sheriff and his posse at the house of Tony, Durant laughed heartily. The sheriff's posse could get plenty of wine, of course, but without water, a man couldn't hope to make the desert voyage even with a mule or a horse to help him on the way. Durant patted the full, rounding side of his canteen. He might even now begin with the first sip, but it was a luxury to postpone pleasure until desire became greater. He raised his eyes along the trail. Close by, it was merely dotted with occasional bones, but distance joined the dots into an unbroken chalk line which wavered with a strange leisure across the Apache desert pointing toward the cool blue promise of the mountains. The next morning, he would be among them. A coyote whisked out of a gully and ran like a great puff of dust on the wind. His tongue hung out like a little red rag from the side of his mouth, 
and suddenly Durant was dry to the marrow. He uncorked and lifted his canteen. It had a slightly sour smell. Perhaps the sacking which covered it had grown a trifle old, and then he poured a great mouthful of lukewarm liquid. He had swallowed it before his senses could give him warning. It was wine. He looked first of all toward the mountains. They were as calmly blue, as distant as when he had started that morning. Twenty-four hours not on water, but on wine. I deserve it, said Durant. I trusted him to fill the canteen. I deserve it. Curse him. With a mighty resolution, he quieted the panic in his soul. He would not touch the stuff until noon. Then he would take one discreet sip. He would win through. Hours went by. He looked at his watch and found it was only ten o'clock. And he had thought that it was on the verge of noon. He uncorked the wine and drank freely. And corking the canteen, felt almost as though he needed to drink water more than before. He sloshed the contents of the canteen. Already it was horribly light. Once he turned the mule and considered the return trip. But he could remember the head of the rabbit too clearly, drilled right through the center. The vineyard, the rows of old, twisted, gnarled little trunks with the bark peeling off. Every vine was to Tony like a human life. And Durant had condemned them all to death. He faced the blue of the mountains again. His heart raced in his breast with terror. Perhaps it was fear and not the suction of that dry and deadly air that made his tongue cleave to the roof of his mouth. The day grew old. Nausea began to work in his stomach. Nausea, alternating with sharp pains. When he looked down, he saw that there was blood on his boots. He had been spurring the mule until the red ran down from its flanks. It went with a curious stagger like, like a rocking horse with a broken rocker. And Durant grew aware that he had been keeping the mule at a gallop for a long time. He pulled it to a halt. It stood with wide braced legs. Its head was down. When he leaned from the saddle, he saw that its mouth was open. It's gonna die, said Durant. It's gonna die. Ah, what a fool I've been. The mule did not die until after sunset. Durant left everything except his revolver. He packed the weight of that for an hour and discarded it in turn. His knees were growing weak. When he looked up at the stars, they shone white and clear for a moment only and then whirled into little racing circles and scrawls of red. He lay down. He kept his eyes closed and waited for the shaking to go out of his body. But it would not stop. And every breath of darkness was like an inhalation of black dust. He got up and went on, staggering. Sometimes he found himself running. Before you die of thirst, you go mad. He kept remembering that. His tongue had swollen big. Before it choked him, if he lanced it with his knife, the blood would help him. He would be able to swallow. Then he remembered that the taste of blood is salty. Once in his boyhood he had ridden through a pass with his father and they had looked down on the sapphire of a mountain lake, a hundred thousand million tons of water as cold as snow. When he looked up now, there were no stars, and this frightened him terribly. He never had seen a desert night so dark. His eyes were failing, he was being blinded. When the morning came, he would not be able to see the mountains, and he would walk around and around in a circle until he dropped and died. No stars, no wind, the air as still as the waters of a stale pool, and he, in the dregs at the bottom. He seized his shirt at the throat and tore it away so that it hung in two rags from his hips. 
He could see the earth only well enough to stumble on the rocks, but there were no stars in the heavens. He was blind. He had no more hope than a rat in a well. Ah, but Italian devils know how to put poison in wine that will steal all the senses or any one of them. And Tony had chosen to blind Durant. He heard a sound like water. It was the swishing of the soft, deep sand through which he was treading. Sand so soft that a man could dig it away with his bare hands. Afterward, after many hours out of the blind face of that sky, the rain began to fall. It made first a whispering and then a delicate murmur like voices conversing. But after that, just at the dawn, it roared like the hoofs of 10,000 charging horses. Even through that thundering confusion, the big birds with naked heads and red raw necks found their way down to one place in the Apache Desert. Mm -hmm.